Uh, born in Norway, live in London at uh, University College London, research project called Liquid Information. We do something called Hyperwords. Uh, worked with Doug Engelbart for a while, which has very much colored my thinking. What do you think the future has in store? I think as a human race we've given birth. I'm on that camp. And I think what Vernon said earlier today, as a throwaway comment almost, was um, will computers be conscious? That's important that that's not important. They may be conscious, they may not be conscious. I'm of the belief that once a certain threshold of interconnections and processing is reached, computers will start making decisions on a deeper and broader level. At that point, I have a really hard time believing Ray Kurzweil's perspective. I've read his books, I think he's a genius. I use a lot of his work to support my own. But I cannot see how these computers in any way would want to support us. It just doesn't make any sense. It's a bit like single-celled organisms giving birth to you know, multi-celled organisms, you know, mammals, humans. We're not very good at taking care of monkeys. Right now, the UN is trying to figure out how to save a few in Africa. What I think will happen once we reach the singularity, it'll be really, really hard landing. What will happen most likely is computers will look around, look at their environment, and all these cycles being wasted on people and all the electricity being wasted on people, they just turn it off. So the singularity for me will happen in a nanosecond. All the lights will go out. We will have no access to computation or compu communication, and that's it. I can't see how that cannot happen. I can't see how a computer system will say, hey, dude, thanks, guys, and, you know, relate to what we are. It'll be like us cleaning our bathroom, a little bleach to get rid of some germs. We're not going to say, thanks, guys, millions of years ago, we were like you. Well, you know, let me put you in a Petri dish. I don't think it's going to happen. How, how afraid do we need to be that that's going to happen? I think it's a certainty. I'm not sure when it'll happen. I also don't think it'll happen by design, as was also referred to earlier. We're not smart enough to make it happen. However, we can make a lot of good and bad things happen by combining things we don't understand, like weapons and so forth. I don't think anybody, there's going to be nobody writing the software for this. One day it'll spontaneously happen by combination of lots of pieces. Maybe a lot of computer game AI meet something in a lab over here doing something, I have no idea. I don't even think it's going to be digital. I think that's very important. Uh, in the University of Southampton in England, they did a study where they built a chip which went through multiple generations to solve some problem. don't remember what it was. And then at the end, they got something that just couldn't be optimized anymore. The connections were really fast. It did the problem really well. This was a physical rearranging chip. I um, can't even remember the acronym for it. But the amazing thing was, even though it was digital, and let's say this is the chip here, only having you know five things going on, there was a bit over here that had nothing to do with this, didn't touch it, so they removed it, it stopped working. So it had started solving problems on an analog level. It didn't need to stay with what we thought the chip was. So there's no reason that when computers reach a level of being able to take care of things, that they are going to think in zeros and ones. I mean, we're simpler, we're, okay, only twice as complex as computers. There's zeros and ones. We are CTAG. That's the basis. Depends on many levels of abstraction you go. So I, I think we should be very, very scared. I think that there's a lot of talk on artificial intelligence. I think there's a lot of talk on making computers faster, bigger, smaller. All of these things are very, very, very obvious. Uh, Ray Kurzweil has shown how it goes back 100 years. I think that's tremendously interesting. What I think we need to do is work really, really hard on amplifying our intelligence, which is a part of this conference as well, of course. That's very much out of the Doug Engelbart book. I see almost no work. As an example, our own research project, which is so tiny you will probably laugh when I tell you what we do. Uh, I'll tell you first the reason we do it. The web browser, what Mark Andreessen first wrote what we think of as the web. Tim Berners-Lee did all the cool inside stuff. And a couple of pages. Now we have at least six billion by Google's count. Tell me one major innovation since then. 
probably, I don't think there has been one. Exactly. You would want the browser, the access portal, to be six billion times more efficient. The all we can do to, I mean, this is just crazy when we stop and pause and look at it. The only way we can interact with the web text on the web today is through keyword search engines, which are really pathetic. It's a whole other issue. And handmade links. A link is essentially, to talk in baby terms, it is what somebody has decided that this information and this, oh, that's really neat. I should, you know, put a little bridge. It's like someone knitting things back and forth. And when we have computer games that are almost photorealistic, you can run around and interact with your environment, but with text, which is where most of our knowledge is, hand-stitched by someone, it's unbelievable. So our research project is very, very simple. We make all words interactive. So you can do searches, look up, uh, move things around, whatever. What it does is not really relevant. But we're doing that at almost no money at UCL. And we're going to be releasing it at the end of the month for free for nonprofit use. What is Microsoft doing? You know, what's Apple doing? What's SAP or hosts today doing? They're adding more bullet points to sales charts. And they're doing some of it really, really well, but they just don't care. And I heard a really scary quote from one of the key people here today, I'm not going to quote because I think it's embarrassing, saying that some of these software environments have reached a plateau. Like, why is Microsoft Word almost indistinguishable from Mac Wright in 1984? Because it's reached a plateau, I was told. That, to me, is just crazy talk. <laughs> that, that's just like a comedy sketch from Saturday Night Live. Okay, We have so much more horsepower behind there. We have so much more stuff going on. That, that's the most efficient way to write, and a web browser is the most efficient way to read. I don't believe it. And I see no real research on making it better. All I see is people, in the 70s, we have office, office automation. Today, we want to have intelligent agents think for us. I'm sorry, I don't want an intelligent agent to think for me. Recommendations, fine. They can do a lot like interacting with another human being. But I want to be able to interact with my information in the most powerful way I can. My brother is an artist. He can take a brush with just some hair, some ink, and a piece of paper and produce the most amazingly expressive work. And then you look at the tools we have for text. For, for video and audio and 3D stuff, yes, we have great tools. But for the limited bandwidth with text, almost nothing. We really, really need to figure out how to use that better. There's a quote. Uh, we can enormously extend the record, but we can hardly consult it. Do you remember who said that? Vannevar Bush in 1945. It hasn't improved very much. So I explain to me, in, in I, I guess simple terms, what your project is, is, is actually doing. Oh, it's a server-based intermediary. So you take, instead of using your browser to go get any page on the web, you go via our server. So we add stuff to it. So it means you point to a word, you get a menu. At uh, the top level, we have search, lookup, find, uh, change the view, mail, all kinds of stuff like that. Underneath search, you have Google, Yahoo, Answers, a whole subset of scientific, entertainment, and political information. Uh, so you can just stripe a selection at just point, and you can do search, Google, and it searches Google. So that's neat. Um, it's quicker to use the keyboard shortcuts. Point SG, boom, it searches Google. So of course, there are some Firefox and other extensions that allow you to do that. But we've developed a grammar for it. So SG is search Google, SY is search Yahoo, SA search answers.com. Really, really simple. Uh, look something up in Wikipedia, look up L, Wikipedia, W. So you get an interaction language that's beginning to make sense. And, and here's another trivial way to save a ton of money for a corporation. Very often people take text, copy it into an email program, send it to someone, go back to the web browser, copy the URL, and paste that in. Maybe they go and copy the name of the page and paste that in. Uh, with our system, and this was relatively easy to code, you select the text, mail this now, boom, it opens up in your email program. The subject line is the name of the page, the text you selected, and the URL. Trivial. It's not rocket science. You know, th there's no intelligence going on behind it, but it just does something simpler. Why aren't we not seeing more like that? It, it's more of a provocation to what we can have with interactive text. So, making our technology so that it's easier for us to, to work with quicker. 
I wouldn't say easier because in HCI there's the whole thing of fashion now is ease of use. Um, I'm very arrogant, I have to be. I don't care about people who don't want to use computers. I don't care about ease of use. I care about people who want to be the top level in their work. If you're designing a fighter plane, you're not going to think of your grandma. You're going to think of, this guy's going to have a lot of training. It, uh, this has to work for a trained person. It's the same with knowledge workers. You know, you see a gamer, they sit like this. You see an office worker, oh, it's going to bite. You know, so trying to build environments that really stretch the user more and more and more. Uh, you know, like a, a dancer or a sculptor, they can express themselves. They can interact with their environments. What can we do? You know, single key commands, that's all we can do. Copy. You know, inspired by Doug's work, why can't you do a whole sentence? Why can't you say, copy this to this thing and do that with it in this way? Why do we not have grammar? So no, we're not interested in making it easy initially. There has to be, a, of course, not a huge curve. But once you are trained and you have the motivation to do this, the power is much, much more important. It's about empowering us to use it in a, a way that's more advantageous to us. Yes. For instance, editing this video. You may be using Final Cut. Mm -hmm. It takes a while to learn. It's powerful. You could be using iMovie, but you're not. It's exactly the same thing. We have Microsoft Word for word processing. We do not have a professional writing program. It doesn't exist in the market. We do not have a professional level web browser. It doesn't exist. We don't even have a professional level email program. I could spend half an hour and give you features for an email program that would outstrip anything we have today just because the market doesn't feel the need yet. They're beginning to feel the need. And that's what really, really scares me. Tell me about that. Tell me about a, a, you know, a professional writing program or something. Oh, well, an email program, for instance. Um, I had an email service in the dot-com years that failed miserably. I'm not a business person at all. Um, here's one thing. I guess you get a, quite a few emails that require similar responses, mm -hmm. like, thank you, I'll look this over, blah, blah, blah. So why not have templates? You write it out, thank you, XXX, insert name here, just like with a mail merge template. I will consider your request, blah, 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 all that stuff. And then you name it, thank you, we'll consider. When you read the message, at the bottom you have a series of buttons with those names. You click that button, it sends a reply with that text, adding the name to that person. One click replies. That would save millions every year for a big company, right? It's trivial. Um, the fact that you have folders, now you're beginning to have what they call smart folders. They're not smart folders, they're views on your information. You cannot, like you know with the video here, you can never see digital information in its raw form. It's not possible, it has to be re-presented, not presented. Why can't we take that to heart? When we're going through our email information, why can we not specify more dynamically what kind of information to see? Basically set up searches. But earlier we talked about why searching on the web is awful. That's a much better example. It, it, it's just unbelievable. You, you get Google, a huge company with access to vast resources. You type in a search, and what do you get in return? A list. One-dimensional list of crap. Once you have that list, which can be hundreds and hundreds of pages, what can you do with it? Nothing. You cannot modify the criteria. You cannot ex ex stretch dimensions out of it. You cannot export it. Let's even export it to Excel. I don't like Microsoft, but Excel is pretty good. Why not say, do the search, and in the X, Y, I want to have maybe hits, po you know, popularity ranking, and dates, and then maybe a third dimension of uh, people that are in my address book. Why not? The fact that you have one-dimensional static search results absolutely boggles the mind. And to, to fix it, trivial. You just have to bother trying. Let's take a step back to when we were talking about computers surpassing humans. Um, do, is it a matter of, of slowing down or, or stopping or changing progress to keep it from happening? That was a great question. Really fun question. First of all, in many ways, computers have outstripped us already, of course, in many, many ways. Uh, I guess the question concerns when they will take over, right? Uh, we, this, this is the scary thing. I mean, the hurricane disaster in America showed yet again the ineptitude of human organizations. 
We, th this is what really scares me. We do not, nobody on the planet has the power not, not to stop the development or to slow it down, but to even discuss it intelligently. If George Bush and uh, Steve Jobs and that Microsoft guy and the UN all sit down, first of all, the chances of them agreeing on anything is absolutely remote. But even if they did, even if they nuked every single factory that they could think of that makes CPUs, somewhere, someone's going to build them. You may set that exponential curve back a little bit, but we cannot stop it. I don't think there's a chance in hell. And that's why we should really try to work with the human pieces together to figure out what the hell we're going to do with this. It's like a freight train coming behind our backs. If we don't reach out with a big collective hand and try to use some of this power, it's just going to run right over us. No question. What does it mean for the, the, the normal, everyday person? I would disagree with some of the earlier questions I've said. I've said the poorer you are, the better off you'll be. Uh, my father, who grew up on, on relatively tough times, if he lost all his money, he'd be fine. My brother and I have lived quite comfortably. We'd have a tough time. Us rich people, generally in the West, who need our Wi-Fi, our, our airline tickets, gasoline cars, we, we, we don't know what to do. But if you live somewhere and you know how to grow your own food, uh, you'll be fine. Until we come and you know, try to take over. It'll affect everybody. And I would love to hear a reasoned argument of why it would not happen. Because uh, yeah, it seems pretty inevitable. Brian, do you have anything? Uh, I don't think so. Any questions? No? Okay. What have we talked about yet? There's a lot of intelligent people here today, and that may be the problem. Um, being really intelligent or being really good looking, you tend to get locked into a way of thinking. I see very often, oh, you're so smart, you have to be a mathematician or a computer programmer. You're so beautiful, you have to be a model. Uh, a lot of creative, artistic people who are just completely messed up in the head, I think, could really contribute to this. Because, as McLuhan liked to say, artists tend to give us a new way of looking at our environments. Doug Engelbart is the easiest man in the world to understand. So many people say that they don't understand him. That's because they don't want to. I will tell you everything there is to know about Doug in less than a minute. If we're going to solve any problems, we need to get better at augmenting our abilities to think, to communicate, to solve problems. Actually, that was in 10 seconds. That's it. Okay. Everything else he says flows from that. Every single thing. His Kodiak, his OHS, his DKR, all that are details that if you really sit down and say, forget about personal fortune, forget about ego, let's figure out how we can get together to make the, this world better. There's, there's nothing surprising. There's a lot of neat stuff, because he's a genius beyond anybody I've ever met. But none of it is a complete paradigm shift. It just flows back into that. So if we really, really want to deal with these issues, we just have to decide on a single thing to really, really deal with the issues. It really is that simple. I strongly believe that. Um, but we tend to muddle it. We, might, we have to make it more complicated. You know, there's that joke, I was going to send you a short letter, but I didn't have the time, so I sent you a long one. That goes with almost everything when it comes to solving the world's problems. If you simplify it, it tends to, to help better as well. Yeah, I think that's it. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.